Hello again, everybody. I'm Joe Prywiller, Conference Director of Plastics News. I'd like to welcome you to our second fireside chat of 2019 and our ongoing series of conversations on key industry topics relevant to our processor community. These discussions are fueled by M. Holland Company and produced by Plastics News, which also posts each fireside chat on our website. We are excited to bring this discussion to you in live video and allow you to interact with our presenters. You have the option to submit questions at any time during the chat, and they will be answered in the order received at the tail end of the discussion. Just click on the Q&A icon on the side of your computer screen and then type in your question. We look forward to your participation and to some compelling questions. Today we'll be discussing an important issue that coincides with much of the positive growth in the plastics industry over the past several years, how to best finance that expansion. As we know, the North American plastics industry is healthy and escalating in size, but navigating through the risks and opportunities has never been more challenging. There is complexity in global competition, mounting trade wars, labor shortages, raw material volatility, and merger and acquisition impacts. Smart finance strategies are a critical element to a company's long-term growth and profitability, and in many cases, it's very survival. This fireside chat will address topics that we are key to financing a modern plastics business, including borrowing alternatives and their benefits and costs, trends in working capital management, financing international operations, and the automation of the finance industry function. Let me now introduce today's speaker. To my immediate left is Kate Rich Choi, a senior product manager at BMO, specializing in cross-border ERP system integrations. BMO is the eighth largest bank in North America, operating primarily as BMO Harris Bank in the US and as Bank of Montreal in Canada. Kate has in-depth experience in file-based solutions with their bank, leveraging today's technology to position themselves for tomorrow's payment flows. To Kate's left is Pat McCune, Chief Financial Officer of M. Holland Company. Pat is responsible for the overall financial management of the company, including accounting and financial reporting, treasury, risk management, and capital strategies. He has more than 25 years of experience in financial leadership positions at manufacturing and distribution companies. Next, I'd like to introduce Bob Rule, Chief Financial Officer of HPC, or Hanson Plastics Corporation, a plastics injection molder. Bob began his career as a staff accountant for a small certified public accounting firm located in Chicago. His career from there took him to roles in companies ranging from magnesium die casting to corrugated packaging. And last but certainly not least, we have with us Carl Skoog, a senior banker with BMO's US commercial banking operations. He partners closely with executive leadership and owners to support value creation and growth leveraging advisory services and has 30 years of experience structuring financing solutions and assisting clients in managing cash flows. Let me now turn the conversation over to our four speakers. As a reminder again, to ask a question, open the Q&A icon on the side of your screen and type in your question at any time during this chat and we'll get to them later in the conversation. We'll kick off today's discussion by looking into whether it's actually a good time to finance. As you've read in Plastics News and elsewhere, acquisition activity and expansion continues to boom and consolidations are also on the rise. Does that make this a good time to look at financing options and consider new approaches? Pat, let's start with you. How do you see this from M. Holland's perspective? Sure, thanks, Joe. Uh, it certainly is a good time, and, and actually for M. Holland Company, it's a, it's a very necessary time. In our strategic business plan, um, first of all, you've talked about the industry growing, and uh, M. Holland is growing right along with that. We've experienced uh, double-digit growth year over year in revenues. And so our strategic business plan really calls for two facets of growth. One is strategic through acquisition, and the other is organic. And, and both of those uh, strategies and, and pathways towards growth require capital and require cash. And so uh, as a net borrower, I'm Holland Company, the opportunity and the ability to finance our business, um, it's a great time for us and a necessary time. And uh, I would add to that 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 in today's uh, marketplace, there's uh, readily available capital at a, uh, a very advantageous cost. Great. Bob, from a small molder perspective, are you seeing the same type of, of situation? 
Yeah, I would I would agree. I think one of the challenges for someone um, maybe along our sides is uh, when you're landing, whether a new customer, or joint, you know, picking up a, a bigger um, book of business from an existing customer. I, you know, you our our folks a lot of times will focus just on the operation side of it. Do I have the right equipment? Do I have the right capacity? And I think the thing that gets left is depending on the size of that potential project is what it's going to do to the balance sheet and your working capital. And I think that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle and I, and, and I can appreciate where, where the, you know, where the numbers are today, because I think that's important for us when we look at it to go, how do we, how do we address that? And having the ability uh, to secure the financing to take care of that's, that's critical for us. Great. And Carl, you, you bring an overall manufacturing perspective. That's not just the plastics industry. Are you seeing, Overall, many companies looking at financing right now, finding this to be a, a good time to do this kind of thing. Oh, for sure, Joe. The uh, you know the markets are wide open, no matter what size the business right now. Uh, banks and other capital providers are all very well capitalized, uh, keen to put money to work and to develop relationships where where that can happen. It can happen lots of different approaches and structures, but absolutely the. It's a great time and relatively low cost time. Yeah, it sounds like there there are some scenarios right now that are that are playing in the favor of financing. I know high growth, and uh, I know Pat, you talked to us about a little bit that that, can, that consumes cash in many cases when you have this kind of thing, right? Yeah, when when you're growing, you're investing in in people and in inventory uh, and facilities and all those things that. Uh, uh, that require cash, and those are investments. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about working capital, but uh, as you grow, uh, we start talking about growing inventory and growing receivables, and that starts to, uh, that's cash sitting in uh, non-cash types of assets. And uh, indeed, it's a, uh, a, a time where cash is consumed through these kinds of investments and, and preparing for uh, expected growth. Great. Yeah, I know we're talking about long working capital cycles, too, for inventory. And you've seen that, too, Bob, that, that type of scenario where your working capital cycles are getting a little bit longer than in the past? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yesterday at the, the summit, one of the statements, or I think one of the statistics, 74% of the molders are $25 million below. And I think for us, when you're working with a lot of customers that are 5, 10, 50 times your size, um, you know, it does become a challenge for you because they have certain expectations and um, looking at the inventory and, and things like that and be able to be, able to be responsive their needs. So, um, yeah, Great. We're, we're, we're constantly keeping our eye on that. Oh, yeah. And, and Bob's referring to the financial summit that Plastics yep. News put yep. on yesterday in Chicago. Give um, the plug. Right. There you go. <laughs> um, and, and in general, we've written about Plastics News, too, that there are plenty of acquisitions still booming. There's, there's a lot of money out there right now. EBITDAs are at a good level for that kind of thing, too, I guess, for, for further acquisitions, as we know. Right, Carl? Oh, yeah, for sure. The Acquisition capital is readily available, and depending on the structure, you know, the different kinds of approaches to, to make those happen. But we've been supportive of that with a number of clients. Yeah. And Carl, sticking with you, too, what benefits are you seeing from financing? Are there, are there reasons that companies, I know it's a good time environmentally, but for a company itself, why, what, what's, what, what's, what benefits them doing it right now? Well, I, th I think every company has to stay ahead of their competition, and part of that is investing. Some of it's investing in growth, like Pat was speaking to in terms of uh, working capital growth uh, and acquisitions just also. Uh, some of it is capital investment, which I'm sure that uh, Bob's been doing that as well, so that uh, uh, yeah, all those different sources of capital or needs for capital are, are being supported. Sure. Uh, Pat or Bob, any, any, any comments there too about how it would benefit you, from your perspective, a manufacturing company do this right now as opposed to just environmentally, but are there reasons internally that this makes sense to do at the moment for, 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 the, for the purposes, I guess, of both capital investment and growth or from the idea of working capital? Yeah, there's, there's two sources of capital. There's debt and equity. And, uh, right. and debt <laughs> capital today is uh, it's hard to beat the cost. Uh, and it has been for a very long time. And so over the last 10 years uh, since the Great Recession, uh, M. Holland Company, but many companies have benefited from the uh, the low cost of capital and the opportunity uh, to to grow in an industry that's growing yeah. and to take advantage of uh, that access to such a such a low cost of capital. It's really uh, we've never seen a time like it, and may never <laughs> will again, right? 
Yeah, what, 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 what's causing that phenomenon right now? Or, or, is, or is it something that's going ongoing for a long well, time? Well, it's been ongoing since the Great Recession, where yeah. you could probably talk a little bit better about interest rates than I can, yeah. but, uh, you know, cost of borrowing has been, you know, under 2.5% for uh, or 3% for uh, a decade. Yeah, for much of the last when you 10 look years. At, yeah. When you look at both LIBOR interest rates and, you know, the premiums or the margins that uh, the companies pay to banks like. Oh, like, sure. You know, yeah. I mean, we're not at zero rate margins like we were. But yeah. though it's not free, but money's still well on sale. So uh, you take it LIBOR, about today it's 250, but you can lock in below 250 longer term and then put your loan spread, which puts your cost of capital today in the four to 5% range as a rule. So if you can make investments at four or 5% and make a return, hopefully you can, Right. you get a return out of that. So it's a great time to invest. Yeah, it sounds like it doesn't show any sign of, uh, of, of changing in the near future anyway. Um, but of course we don't know, but right now is right now is good to jump on, I suppose, right? With this kind of thing. You find that too, Bob? You're shaking your head there? Uh, no, I'm, I'm agreeing kind of with the, yeah. uh, the, uh, the general theme here. Um, I, I think for us, it's it, it just, uh, it's a necessity, um, no matter what, with, with the customer base we have. Again, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's it's kind of your, your ticket to the dance, if you will. You've got to be able to have that flexibility and have the ability um, to be able to make intelligent financing decisions. Uh, you just can't do without it. Well, speaking of intel, go ahead. Pat. I would add to that that, you know, there are there's many businesses that don't need debt financing, right? They they right. are profitable enough and generate enough cash through their operations that they can fund their, their own business. Um, plastics may be a little different in, in many areas. I know in the on the mm -hmm. distribution side, uh, you know, there's uh, margins are often compressed. Uh, and we have long working capital cycles, so it's a it's a necessity not just for strategic growth, but uh, daily operating needs. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking of which, there there are a lot of smart financing options out there to do sure. this, and that that leads right into that. I mean, besides besides using traditional <clears throat> banks, are there other options too that that uh, that are worth looking at with some of this? Talking about the equipment finance providers, uh, you know, other kind Talking of finance supply tools. chain finance. Yeah, yeah, supply yeah. chain finance tools. Yeah, we're we're presented with that uh, sometimes from customers, typically larger customers that may be uh, looking for options to extend their working capital cycle and and offering some supply chain finance uh, opportunities for us. And uh, you know, there's there's a cost to that because essentially, uh, I think in in that process, uh, they're giving us the opportunity to be paid either timely or earlier. But also at a cost, right? Because sure. there's a, it's almost like a factoring where we have to pay a, a certain fee to get our money earlier. Sure. And um, so, you know, we've thought through that in different ways, and uh, in, oftentimes because there's an administrative burden to that as well in terms of uh, using the various bank sites or uh, the process that you have to go through. Um, you know, oftentimes we'll consider negotiating a different arrangement within. Within the terms that we offer customers, uh, we'll we'll consider reviewing those and negotiating a deal between us rather than getting a, a bank involved, uh, where there's some administrative burden on the part of us to get paid. Yeah, I, I imagine it depends on the scenario, right? Whether right. whether traditional banking is involved or whether other kind of financing options are available with supply chain. Yeah. With this, um, and Carl, I know we've talked a little bit about EBITDA. <clears throat> right now, it's between the ten. Really, between the 10 million and the 25 million dollar range at the moment, and that seems to be a sweet spot right now for acquisition yeah. for activity, right? Yeah, well, I guess what you're speaking to is a is a question of at what size range do different kinds of financing become more available? Yeah, and become right. more aggressive. Right. Uh, certainly, there are financing ranges along the entire spectrum of EBITDAs. We find, however, there's greater flexibility, particularly in an acquisition environment. But also in an investment environment, when you get to $10 million of or above, where there's greater flexibility, and then even greater flexibility beyond that at around $25 million, it's just it's a comfort zone for most lenders that they will treat you differently and they'll give you more flexibility in terms um, to allow those things to happen because of greater scale, more diversification that usually comes through those things. And, and, and it can lead to higher debt acquisitions, I guess, in some cases? Sure, uh, and fairly or unfairly, sponsor owners, private equity owners, um, typically can get a significantly higher leverage profile, and uh -huh. typically do, whereas historically industrials, 
usually cap out around a three times EBITDA multiple, total funded debt to mm -hmm. EBITDA. Um, you know, in this environment for larger companies, it, it gets a little bit higher. And then when it comes to sponsors putting capital in their deep pockets behind it and layering other types of debt behind it, you're seeing four or five, six times leverage. Mm. Uh, you're seeing higher debt finance uh, these days too for acquisitions also? Absolutely. Yeah. So to some extent, the debt helps fund those higher acquisition multiples. Okay. I mean, they go hand in hand in many cases with this. Uh, but so if you're looking to get in the market and either buy or sell, it's a good time also, besides just uh, general financing in some cases. No, for sure. A lot of competition. Um, yeah. If you find the right transaction and a good fit for your business, absolutely. Yeah. And I know M. Holland has made a series of acquisitions and expansions too over the last mm -hmm. few years and driven by some of this anyway. Absolutely. It's been, it's been a good time. And uh, uh, we've had very strong support from our banks. Uh, we learned a lot over the course of time about some of the different financing opportunities. Uh, we talked about cash flow versus ABL, and uh, several years ago, we went uh, into an ABL facility that was uh, very advantageous for us, provided a, uh, a lot of availability um, from, in terms of borrowing capacity at a low cost. And, uh, and we've been able to use that to fund, uh, fund most of our acquisitions. ABL. Yeah, so based uh, lending. Yeah, yeah. Right. Probably, you could probably maybe speak to that. Yeah, maybe we should talk about that a little bit. It seems like that's worked for you. And, and why is why is that an important piece of this? Yeah, briefly, it's just a question of how, you, how can you get the greatest and most flexible debt? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes your multiple of leverage allows you to max out uh, if you don't have as many assets, if you're more asset heavy such as a distribution business where you're carrying a lot of inventory, the leverage multiple is limiting. So an asset-based lending structure can often be give you more capacity and also more flexibility. Uh, and just quickly, a, a general guide is that a company that's business is 5% or less in terms of a percentage of total sales of EBITDA, so 5% EBITDA business, or below typically doesn't create enough cash flow to self fund growth. And as you get over 10%, you have a greater capacity to do that and you can fund yourself more often from cash flow. So the ones over 10% tend to be more cash flow driven in most cases, not all. Under 5% tends to be a better fit for ABL. And as you go farther up, it you know just gets much more focused on cash flow. What, what um, and any of you can answer this, but what, what are lenders looking for basically in, 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 in money? You mentioned that it's, it's competitive out there, it's finding the right, finding the right situation. What are some of the, what, what kind of attributes in a company are lenders looking for? Well, uh, first is, is the soft issue of leadership and the people who are running the business ah, that, okay. you're, that you're confident so in them and people. they're capable of doing that. Yeah, people. Yeah. Uh, but the rest of it is uh, stability of cash flows, uh, quality of assets, depending on the structure, um, concentrations of end markets and customers, and sometimes supplier concentrations if if that's a risk. So it gets kind of down to Porter's five forces if you think of it that way. Can companies are there, are there things that, that processors can do to help fortify that too? The, to, when they're looking at maybe I maybe I want to get in a situation with the bank. What, what what makes them more attractive? In other words, to a lender, what can they do? Well. Um, to some extent, you are what you are when you come in, right? right but if sure. you're preparing for that, and if you're trying to do a step change in your business, and you want to use leverage to make that happen, first operationally, you have to be ready for it. You need to have the team and the leadership and the bench in order to take that next step. You need to have the systems in place to make it effective. Uh, and then you need to think about your strategy. And if your strategy is to grow with one customer, uh, that's probably not going to be met very well by the lending institutions if you need to leverage up to get there. So looking at diversification of end markets, products, customers, are things that you may have some ability to influence. Sure, make a change. Um, let's get into working capital for a little bit because that, that's another important aspect of this whole piece, I guess, besides the financing portion, but the working capital. I know, Kate, let me get you in the conversation. You, you deal with automation and some of the some of the digital tools and how important as as we know there's there's been a real need for digital transformation to take place for automation to take place and uh, 
what are some of the tools you're seeing from a working capital standpoint that, uh, sure, that companies use? So as companies grow, they naturally want to um, take manual processes out of their business, right? They want to automate for improved security and for better control over money out and money in to their bank accounts. So sometimes companies will decide to automate a process, whether AP payments or payroll payments. And when they take that and take a look closely at the process, take it from a person pulling down information, keying it in multiple places to everything contained within an ERP or treasury workstation or an accounting system and automating that flow, then they have an easier time uh, determining when to make the payments. So as you're talking about managing that supply chain, um, you can control it more precisely by putting in automated steps. And a lot of times I hear that companies can help manage their outgoing payments by right. automating them because then it's not so time consuming. Yeah, that's uh, th that makes sense. Um, I imagine a lot of this, for, for a company standpoint, they have to be fairly rigorous, fairly disciplined in how they do this. Are there steps can be taken uh, to establish that kind of discipline for working capital so that you're not over exceeding some of this anyway? Go ahead, Bob. No, I was gonna go or Pat. I, I was going to say, I, I know that you're into automation yeah. and, uh, and helping companies do things uh, more precisely and, and with mm -hmm. less manual hands in it. But yes. If you think about the working capital cycle and, and uh, purchasing of inventory and sales and the collections, um, the discipline around uh, having good efficient processes like invoicing every day, um, uh, making sure that your invoices are accurate, uh, electronic invoicing if possible to customers. Because what happens along the way, there's uh, invoices get lost in the garbage can and in the mail and in other places. And, and, I, and the importance of uh, having good, efficient processes, not having a lot of discrepancies on your invoices, all that kind of stuff is is critical. It could mean days. Uh, and Absolutely. then when you deploy your uh, a bank's tools around the, that process, it could mean it could mean several days in a that misapplied so. cash or, you exactly, know, yeah. unapplied cash is very difficult to remediate, right? Usually it requires some sort of reach out to whoever's paying you for which invoices are you paying? Is yeah. it this month or last month? So as a banking industry, we're really evolving toward being able to send out electronic invoices in a more standardized way mm -hmm. through um, tools provided by the ISO 20022 standard, um, and then receiving that remittance that you send out back along with the payment and having them travel really together sure. in a more automated way and making it easy for those suppliers to pay you um, just by having it in more standardized, right? Because invoices tend to be all across the board, especially if yeah. you've got um, large and small companies that you're paying, they look differently. So they're difficult to capture on the outgoing payment side. And um, it does tend to be manual to take that information and send it back today. But it's getting better. <laughs> That's Sorry to interrupt you. No, you're fine. You're good. Um, I imagine achieving the balance between accounts receivable and accounts payable is important with this. And uh, Well, I, the, I think you were maybe getting to the point of the uh, relationships with customers and suppliers. Is sure. that part of it? Yeah, that is definitely part uh, of it. You know, sure, we would, uh, you know, we, we, have, we have terms with our suppliers and uh, we stick to those, right, because they expect us to and, and it's uh, important for us to maintain a good relationship there. Would we like to push our suppliers more than we than we do sure that would help our working capital cycle but at the risk of damaging relationships maybe not having available uh, access to inventory um, and product to sell in the marketplace so there's a balance there and we have to do the, and the customers have to do the same with us and we have to do the same with customers because um, if I just do what I want, I can I can make my days go down and my cash flow really good, but it's gonna it's gonna make some people angry At what along cost, the way. Right? So yeah. it's a balance of uh, of relationships and it's a balance of uh, cash flows and it's a balance of of what the business needs. Right. Any back best practices that you're using, Bob, and at HBC? Um, I don't know that any necessarily best practices other than I think I would just kind of um, add on to Pat's comment. I you know as he said, with your, your relationships. For us, I think one of the keys has been to have the, 
the discipline internally that um, you'll understand where the terms are and you acknowledge that, but making sure that at least we're keeping on top of that. I think that's the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. and sometimes it seems like when things slide you know, a little bit, um, if you're not sticking in with the terms, uh, you get yourself in some hot water. So, but, that, but that's also just the, the relationship thing too, right? Um, you know, if we're working with a customer and they know that we're on top of, of the payment terms and it, it's what we agreed upon. It's just that we know for our benefit, you know, and hopefully that, you know, the, and, I, and they do understand that, but it's you're making the communication and, find, and keeping that balance of, of the discipline without upsetting the apple cart and, and mm -hmm. having a relationship go sour. Um, so I, it's really just, it goes back to just making sure we're on top. Of it. There's no really, there's no magic sauce yeah. for us. Yeah, exactly. There's no, there's no, there's no playbook you can use for this. It's just a matter of keeping on top of it. It sounds like. And sometimes it's from customer to customer. Absolutely. Um, I mean, when you're, when you're doing that outreach, you know, of course you'd want to make all of your payments on a card and get that yeah. rebate and receive all of your payments via ACH, right? That's the most efficient way a lot of times, but that's not reality, right? right. There's so many uh, counterparty agreements that you have to work within. Like you say, it does truly vary vendor to vendor. They're still sell selling stamps. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> and we're still seeing lots of checks in lockboxes sure. absolutely yeah. you know <laughs> another aspect of this is converting this to cash quickly too right and uh, making it work for you also right absolutely um you know we could grow sales and and uh and have a lot of inventory but that's uh that's cash in another form that's sitting on the floor right and uh at the end of the day uh cash is uh is king as they say right and it's important uh, and necessary for businesses to uh, to operate number one and, and absolutely to grow. So it's um, managing the days in your cycle from the time you purchase that inventory until you collect cash and get it in the bank and, and are able to use it again is very important. And so it's not really about how much you have, it's about, it's about the velocity uh, at which you you move those receivables and inventory through the through the cycle, you know, through what they call the operating cycle, and uh, that's how you generate profit, and and that's how businesses stick around and grow. Sure, exactly. But I mean, it's yeah. easier said than done in some cases. No right? doubt, yeah. no doubt. <laughs> you, yeah. you find it, any, anything you're using there, Bob? That... Um, again, I feel like I'm hopping on patch train, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> Uh, it, but it's true that velocity. Um, we we really look at from the the moment the order is placed to the cash is collected, and we really try hard um, to, to acknowledge the steps along the way. Um, we will uh, go to the point of if even doing some back office mapping. Even when, when that order walks in, where is that that downtime, that grade time, where you're like, well, this is unproductive. It's just not moving the order forward. Um, and then it even goes out to the floor. I mean, sometimes I think it's just from, from our perspective, from the accounting side, we look at it. Well, it's stuff we can touch, but it really even happens out on the floor. Again, if I'm looking from that minute that order is placed to I'm collecting the cash, the, the, the production is a big part of that. So what can we do out on the floor to make things even quicker mm. I mean, for, for our for our business, it's uh, anything from making sure materials ready, to materials on hand, to making sure that you're, you know, get into the, the setups of a job and, and making those things accelerate. And it's interesting because a lot of times you want to try to make that connection for your for your people out on the floor. It's you know they you know you want to be able to help them see beyond. Well, you're asking me to do a setup quicker. Well, here's all the other here's the connectivity all the way back, especially for Nissan, to the health of our organization. Isn't simply saying, oh boy, it'd be great if that, that setup could be X better, but it's about making sure that it goes back because again, for an ESOP, it eventually will get into our pocket. So, yeah. When he was talking about talking about setups of equipment, yeah. we don't have that, but uh, but we put inventory on the floor. And so when you think about the business processes that impact working capital, you think about forecasting, right? And and how much inventory you're going to put on a floor, where are you going to put it? Uh, the importance of having some discipline around that. Uh, because businesses uh, or businesses gained or lost over the course of time. And if we're not paying attention to that as we're forecasting, you can wind up in situations where you've got too much inventory that's hard to sell or hard to move or is maybe in the wrong place in the country and you gotta pay more to get moving around. So uh, even those kinds of business processes really can lead to impacting the, uh, the working capital cycle. If, if I can, I'm just Please curious, go. what kind of KPIs or key uh, Key production in, um, 
of course, I'm stumbling with words, but KPIs that you use to kind of track your working question. capital. Uh, oh, for working capital. Well, we have, uh, uh, speaking of the forecasting, we uh, we monitor days on hand by product, uh, product family and, and, and part class probably. Um, so we have targeted uh, levels of, of or days on hand in uh, by inventory class uh, in our organization, and so uh, we we balancing uh, capital access and availability along with uh, meeting customer demand, right? And mm -hmm. and having not only what's out there for forecasted demand, but we also want to take opportunities to uh, to capture new new opportunities right and unforecasted demand that may occur and oftentimes we need we need product on the floor to sell so uh we measure days in days in inventory we may we measure uh day sales outstanding uh, and oftentimes we're doing that by our by region or by business unit um we know very well what our what our payment cycle is uh it's never more than than customer terms or supplier terms and uh, and we're often taking discounts too there. So DSO and, and days on hand and inventory are, are the primary measurements for us. Yeah, pretty much the same for us. Um, from a production standpoint, um, we talk about the inventory. We'll, we'll, we'll have some to help the inventory turns out. You can get into concepts such as Kanban and things like that, um, which is exceptionally um, useful in the production environment. Um, my my past, uh, I guess, uh, exposure, and a lot of times on a production floor is you'll you'll set up a job and it's convenient to let it run a little bit longer than needs be. So Kanban can help you kind of minimize your inventory, which in in turn uh, will allow you to have um, you know to help it help free up the cash because it's not sitting in in the warehouse. So. Ah. and I know you do a lot of that in HPC. Uh, Kanban yeah. and some other tools yeah. of some of this. Yeah, so. and that goes back to the the discipline concept. It's we're constantly revisiting those numbers. It's it was interesting. We went through and had a ton of them set up this last year, over 150 of them. And the team kind of sat back and said, "Okay, we, we're there." And it's like, "Well, no, wait a minute. Now it's it's now it's 2.0 because whatever you set before, how can we lower the bar even even more?" So again, it's not on the shelf. It's it's generating cash. Yeah. You know, obviously you want to take care of the customer, but you, you have room. You have room to grow on it. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's tie this all back into financing a little bit and, and, and tools to use some of this. And Carl, I know you had some thoughts there about uh, uh, assisting in the, assisting in supply chain finance with finance with with uh, with financing tools that are out there. Right. Well, Pat spoke to this to some extent earlier that there have evolved a number of tools that have become more common um, from the days when your options was a lender or a factor in order to get your money. Uh, it's evolved from both ends. Uh, suppliers who want to extend terms will offer, as Pat was talking, uh, advantage terms in theory, or in fact, to uh, make it easier for you to accept their long dated terms. And there's all kinds of names and exceptions that I could talk about, but I'll skip the names. <laughs> so, but it allows you to borrow money basically from their banks based on their credit uh, and get paid early at a discount. Um, there are the other side of things is if you have concentrated accounts and they're high quality credits, there are people who will discount those uh, to you in a more advantaged way than you're getting from your lenders and in a much more efficient and cost effective way than a factor would do. So that's the key element of supply chain finance, though I wouldn't omit the fact, as uh, was mentioned a minute ago by uh, Others is that uh, credit cards and corporate payments basically are a form of supply chain finance. Mm -hmm. And one of the other incentives for using a service like that that we're seeing on the treasury side is data, right? If you want perfect remittance data, you can have this um, vendor portal that they can go and pull down the data, but then maybe they accept a card or they would accept an ACH with interchange, a non-traditional treasury payment type in exchange for that perfect data. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, let's let's get into the automation aspect, finance automation, in some case aspect too, with some of this as far as as far as both cost and uh, and, and and keeping discipline to doing some of this anyway. 
Um, what are some of the benefits of risk of automating the finance function? Are there other, I know we talked about the benefits a little bit, but are there risks too? How do you avoid, how do you sidestep or avoid some of those? Yeah, so from the, the payments and reconciliation perspective, um, so there are risks inherent when a person is using a browser service, right? So we've seen a lot right. of fraud attempts in um, the treasury space where it comes in as an email to the team. It looks like it's from the CFO. Please go do this wire. Well, so many of the companies have been hit with that type of a fraud or attempted fraud. So ah. many companies will look at removing the wire in a browser function completely and doing everything in their ERP system or the accounting system to send it through a secure pipe so there's no manual intervention mm, okay. as a way to protect themselves from um, fraud attempts and as well as improving processes in general. Ah, you take your fraud out of the equation as much as you can. Right? Exactly, by removing those manual steps. You're not, you're not miskeying, you're not um, adding a zero to an outgoing payment, that kind of a thing. Um, so it does help. But there are a lot of moving parts involved too, I, I imagine, as far as invoicing, formatting, some of the other steps that... Uh... Absolutely. So there, there's a number of bank standard formats that many systems can generate right. to tackle that type of a problem. And so if companies are looking to automate part of the process, the first step is always, well, what can my system do? You know, mm -hmm. can it produce a NACHA file to automate ACH payments? Can it produce an EDI or an ISO file? Um, and then go from there. Right, or are you looking at that bank re reconciliation process and maybe I wanna accept a BAI2 file because I can take in that information and parse it out to my back offices. So it depends on which piece of the puzzle you wanna tackle, you know, is it on the receivable side? Do I get an, you know, a receivables file and then work from there? It just depends on the company structure and where the pain point really resides um, and then what system capabilities are available. Yeah. yeah. I just have a question about that. Yeah, sure. Once once that is set up, mm -hmm. um, is, is it hard to change? I mean, like you have a new ERP system or yeah. bank accounts change, you name it. Whenever, it's a good question. Whenever that structure changes, what does that look like for a customer? Yeah, so usually the time to change is during an ERP upgrade mm -hmm. or enhancement because it is hard to change, right? There's a manual setup process that has to be done with that bank integration that can be time consuming. Um, and then once it's set up, it's invisible, right? No one has to touch it until you have to make a change. Right. Typically when you're changing your internal system that creates a file, it's like starting over. It, it really is. So um, there are tools that can make that process easier. Adding accounts, things like that, changing accounts tend to be just a small incremental change, not nearly as in depth but once you've got the connectivity established and everything, um, they're not quick hits. Yeah. Um, it does tend to take a couple of months usually to set something like that up. Yeah. So while you're under the hood with the new Make ERP sure system, that's what you do it. Right? No, it does. Right. <laughs> that change? Uh, it, 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 does it differ from how you work with smaller and larger companies with some of this? And maybe you two can, can relate to that too, how you set this up, what's needed, how much you invest in something like this even. Absolutely, right? So a smaller company might move from a manual process to like a browser upload. Maybe they don't have the capability of sending files in an automated way or scripting files. So they might take an Excel file and upload it on a bank portal. That's one way to gain automation. Um, a very large company, they probably have the ability to push a button and get some sort of bank standard file out of their system and then you start with that. So um, there's really everything in between as well. One thing to keep in mind when we think about AP outsourcing or payments automation is there's a lot of fintech providers that offer a piece of the service, but they tend to be um, not necessarily relationship banks for mm -hmm. a company. So as you're evaluating um, an AP outsourcing type process, um, it's important to just keep in mind who the counterparties are for the full flow. Yeah. So I, Go ahead. I would just use one example. I, over over time, we have used uh, like receivables matching, mm -hmm. where we get a file from the bank from our lockbox, it applies automatically to uh, to our receivables file and applies the cash. And so mm -hmm. it takes it takes a manual intervention out of it. There's always exceptions that of need course. to be dealt with. And the one thing I would emphasize is is having a uh, 
a biz, a continuous improvement mentality around that. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not looking for opportunities to, you know, not just fix the exception, but to to resolve the issue of what's causing the, ex yeah. the exception, then when your business grows, you just got a lot of exceptions. You need more people to <laughs> deal with exceptions when you're using <laughs> technology. And so, uh, you know, it's a it's a mindset that is required. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there's almost that. always things yeah. that you can do, right? Like there's technology that's advancing so quickly right now. There's um, everything from API-based services to, um, you know, just the industry is moving forward in a more standardized way that can help to tackle those exceptions <clears throat> instead of just throwing people at the problem. Yeah, absolutely. Bob, from, from, your, from your standpoint, yeah, I talked about Kanban and some of that for, yeah. for automated systems. Is, 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 a, is a big benefit just freeing up people and time for some of these other operations or other other benefits that you're seeing with automation or how you're using it? Yeah, uh, in the accounting area, we don't we don't have that not embraced or, or considered a lot of automation. But the last couple of days, uh, <laughs> I'm hearing very um, convincing um, arguments from that direction. Or, and so, but I think that we look at it for our, for our group is is when again in our culture is to. to you get into a very continuous improvement mindset. So anything that we can bring to the table that, that allows um, any one of our fellow um, employee owners to uh, free up time to get actively engaged in other areas to improve the business, it's 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 a pretty simple win for us. So I, th I think it'd be very intriguing for, for our organization to look at. Yeah, I wonder if some of it's some of it's uh, freeing up waste, uh, some of the manual operations that yeah. don't take a whole lot of uh... Right. Brain power to do, I guess, in right. some cases that that can be useful with some of this, right? right. Yep. Absolutely, it's those non-core activities that are very time-consuming that can often be rerouted with technology. Uh, yeah, yeah. Before we clue the section two, we should we'd be remiss if we didn't get into cybersecurity mm -hmm. and some of the issues with uh, with breaches of data and those kind of things. Uh, how do you protect yourself from some of that? And what are what are what are some of the ways? Uh, what are some of the warning signs or some of the ways that you can you can uh, get around some of that with automated systems and data yeah. collection i mean some of the simple things you can do are just have dual approvals within your um, payment flow you can have um, um, positive pay on your outgoing checks make sure that the the payee is the correct person mm -hmm. that it's going to um, there are many very simple things that that can be done to to tackle cyber training, cyber training is important too we have uh uh, deployed some, our IT team has brought some really neat training to our organization. There are there are a series of videos that are probably three to four minutes long that uh, get emailed to you. There's a link and they talk about phishing and they talk about all the other types of scams that you can run into, both physical security and IT security. And so uh, I think those are fed to us once a month or once every couple of weeks. You tell I'm probably a little bit behind in, in my uh, sessions, but uh, training is very important. But and the mm -hmm. things you talk about, like positive pay and so on, are are critical things and to to prevent some of these things. Anything hey, you see from a financing perspective? Um, I, well, I, I'm not so sure from that, but in dialogues with clients with regards to cyber, um, the things that we have conversations with are all about processes. And understand that when you're out making payments to people, particularly electronic payments, it's a battlefield. And you have to be constantly vigilant. You have to have disciplines in terms of what happens when somebody sends you a change in payments. Um, and you have to stick to it every time. Mm -hmm. Most of the clients I've had that have had issues related to this had pretty good policies. And somebody followed most of them yeah. in the incident where <laughs> things didn't exception. go well. yeah. <laughs> um, You really have to be disciplined and everybody on the team has to. I think that gets back to the training Pat yeah. was talking about. Mm -hmm. And the other point I'll say, and I'll stop on this, is uh, if you are planning on doing a cyber check or a cyber investment or cyber review and you've got it on the schedule, move it up. Do it yeah. now if you can. If you've got it scheduled for next year, do it this year. If it's next month, do it this month. Whatever you can to do to not let that slide. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Just uh, you, you just never know when uh, something's going to happen. Is that is that the main reason for that? Because they're trying more every day. Sooner, probably going to happen sooner rather than later. Right. Yeah. Right. And exactly. the scams are getting more and more advanced as well. Yeah. So it's not the ones that we saw five years ago. They really are learning with the technology um, and getting smarter about contextualizing that request. Mm. So. Yeah. 
they're adapting to. So absolutely with this. Well, with that I think we'll get to some questions that we have from the audience. And again, I should mention that uh, please type your questions in the chat box on the side of your screen, and uh, we'll get them in order to receive. So we'd like to hear from you with any questions that you might have. First one that I have here: What do you consider an industry standard for debt to asset ratio? Is there an industry standard for that kind of thing, or or what are the variables involved in it? And maybe as as a as a way to do that. And it's easier of you to track that when you're looking at your numbers. Uh, we we track a uh, leverage ratio, which is debt to we we use debt to EBITDA. I don't know if that's sort right. of the standard, but um, that's something that we use. I think that I think uh, I'm not sure that I know what what whether there's a standard or not. I know how financial institutions right. probably think about it when it starts to get above four. So that's right. more considered highly leveraged, and below that, again, it depends. Sometimes yeah. the number's three, sometimes it's five. Okay. Uh, and if you're a pure ABL and you're covering your cash, it's almost infinite. So yeah, I, you, I think it's yeah. I think it's dependent upon your business, and yeah, uh, yeah I think yeah. I think when you get into the four and five range, that's yeah. you're looked at a little differently by the financial institutions, right? Uh, yeah, I guess the simple answer is specifically to that question. I don't think there is a strong guide on debt to assets that we okay. use. Yeah, it's situational in some cases, I imagine. Um, annual audits, someone's asking here whether, what level of financing do investors require annual audits? I would say generally, if you're borrowing more than $5 million, most people are going to want that. Um, it's, uh, but it depends. Some lending groups are less disciplined on that than others. One thing I would add to that is that um, I know a lot of companies, especially smaller ones that don't need an audit, avoid it. Cost, it's more costly, oh, it sure. takes more time, but it also uh, creates some good discipline in your organization too. If you're a growing company uh, and you know you're gonna get there, um, you know, much like cybersecurity, it, uh, it doesn't hurt to have that. I think it, it helps you build disciplines in your organization. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, here, here's a question that we don't talk about the sweet spot of the 10 million to 25 million for availability of, of, of for financing any way of cash and that kind of thing. Are you seeing more traditional financing institutions such as banks competing heavily for potential deals against private lenders in that sweet spot that we attend the 25 million dollar range for plastics businesses? Seems, seems this 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 uh, this person says seems to be the emergence of search fund lenders in this range. Uh, thoughts on either path and uh, or search fund lenders? Well, it, it kind of depends on ownership as to where you're more likely to do things. If if you're a privately held business and not owned by professional capital, um, it's still predominantly traditional banks doing most of the lending. When you get into leveraged transactions that are owned by sponsors and private equity firms, uh, the non-bank lenders of various kinds are very active doing unit tranche and other kinds of structures. Okay. So um, both are very active and it's it gets back to circumstances as to who will go the farthest at the best price. Yeah. So look at all options, I guess anyway. Um, yeah. Okay. That's that sounds good. For for machinery capex investments for increased capacity, what is the average depreciation period you're seeing classes businesses take? Is it five years, ten years, another uh, type of uh, variable? I can't speak to depreciation. I'll leave that to Bob. But uh, in terms of amortization for long life kinds of assets, seven years is a pretty common financing amortization. Yeah, no, we, we, we've been looking at seven years on our side. So. Okay, that's pretty, that's pretty standard. Uh, again, type in your questions. We have, we have time for more, so uh, we hope to hear from you. One we have here, if you're refinancing all your debt, what is the maximum term available with equipment as collateral? Can the amortization be 10 years and perhaps a balloon payment in a shorter period? Uh, if What's the, the maximum it, term it, available it, yeah. for, with equipment Pure equipment financing, if yeah. that's what it is, as yeah. opposed to general corporate financing backed by the assets. There are some assets that they'll do 10-year amortizations. Okay. Let's... Let's talk for a minute about some of the some of the variables that we're talking about for with capital with with, with uh, commodity-based residents having volatility going up and down and changing. Is that is that a risk that somehow with, with working capital? How do you get around some of the some of the uh, volatility that you see with with residents sometimes with some of this and that end of it, the materials? 
Yeah, so uh, I can speak a little bit to that. When when we have um, when we have rising prices, we are and we, we may be selling the same amount of quantity to a customer, or buying the same quantities of materials. Uh, but we don't pay in pounds. We have to pay in dollars. So uh, you can be conducting the same level of business, and if uh, prices go up 10% and sort of remain at that elevated level over a period of time, uh, you are now have 10 10% more dollars invested in working capital for the same amount of business. So right. it uh, we tend to like lower prices from from a working capital perspective. Sure. Uh, because we can do more business with the with the availability and the capacity that we have. Um, if the question is going to hedging raw material prices, yeah, I was I'm not ask sure you about if that's that. what that is. Or I, not. I was going to ask you about that, whether, whether hedging is a good strategy yeah. to use. Uh, we, we do a lot of hedging around interest rates uh, and foreign currency, but uh, we haven't really seen the liquidity in the marketplace to, to be hedging resins and hedging polymers. I think, I think the companies that uh, do that best are probably the the producers because they can they can hedge the feedstocks, right? right. They can hedge uh, ethylene or uh, propylene or something like that. Hedging the polymers, uh, we've looked at it, uh, we've talked to people about it, haven't seen a good solution from our perspective. Yeah, it's been around a long time. But I don't know if it's been used I, uh, I that frequently. We have not been. Using it. Yeah, and you're in too, Bob. You seeing it at all? No, not really. Yeah, uh, and you dealing the same way with volatility of materials yeah. and uh, or the other practices you're using for that? Uh, nothing really specific. Um, can't say that there's probably a lot applied to it for us. So. Yeah. Also, I don't, oh, go ahead. We, I mean, we we physically hedge if if that makes any sense, and that means that when we see markets going down, um, we are selling our inventory, right? Because okay. we know we know what's coming. Sure. And. Um, and when markets are going up, we we, we act differently in, in that world too. Yeah. And, and I have one other thing I'll say to that Please. question is that one of the best solutions is just to have more liquidity, ah. is to go into a dynamic. If you know you're in a volatile industry, you need to reserve more excess cash availability, either cash or, or liquidity under your lines. Yeah, okay. That's where ABL has helped us a lot. And, I, and we, we got educated by our bankers over the course of time. <laughs> That's um, a best, best lending. Huh? It, has, it has helped us um tremendously uh with availability of our uh of our line of credit and our cash available to to borrow and to and to fund our growth so um i'm not sure we could have done what we were doing under a cash flow type of a deal mm. how do you reconcile uh, excessive or obsolete equipment and and, and some of those areas and uh and we, when you're talking about cash cash conversion and uh, keeping working capital, because there's always going to be that, obviously, to deal with. Bob? As far as, I would say, inventory, because I think you said equipment and inventory. Yeah. You know, the inventory, again, it goes back to that discipline and making sure. It, could, it can go all the way back to that production concept, that production dilemma, right? Keeping on top of making sure we're keeping the orders tight, keeping uh, within, you might have uh, stocking agreements you can, you can get some help on, but um, it's, it's about the discipline of, if you see anything start to get a little long in the tooth, that you're, you're chasing it down, um, you're, you're communicating with the customer. You have to so stay on top of that, I imagine, for working capital perspective too, I would think. Yep, yep. Uh, in some cases. Um, a question, I, I don't know how well any of you can answer, but from this, from this perspective, what are you seeing multiples from molders for EBITDA ranges? Uh, 500k, 2 million, 10 million, et cetera. Any, we talked about this a little bit already, I think, uh, early on, but we're seeing for EBITDA multiples. Um, for those size companies, is that the question? Uh, it doesn't really say, just say multiples from molders, uh, injection molders, I would say primarily mid sized companies. Uh, you know, right. Maybe 50, 100 million dollars in sales. Range it's it's going to range widely because the end markets and the uniqueness and the value proposition can vary significantly in the molding space. Um, but it, I think generally they're going to flow with the the relatively high multiples that this industry pr provides for. So um, I would say, you know, maybe six on the low end. Um, it, again, assuming there's reasonable scale in the business. Um, but for something that's really attractive, it could be eight to ten times for a really strong, attractive business. Okay.
Question here too, with the current low cost of capital environment that you're in, do you see an overvaluation of acquisitions? Uh, how do you mitigate this and prepare for a po possible environment of higher interest rates post acquisition? I don't know, is that more a corporate question? Could you ask that one more time, please? With the current low cost of capital that we're in, with the environment we're in for low cost of capital, you see an overvaluation of acquisitions. Are they overvalued right now? And the second part of that is how do you mitigate this and prepare for environment of possible environment of higher interest rates that might happen in the future when yeah. the acquisition is completed? So I suppose when, when money's cheap, maybe, maybe some people uh, feel they can throw it around a little bit more loosely than, than they would otherwise if it's more expensive. Um, I'm, I'm sure that that's possible. And I think sure. uh, around... The, the low ca cost of capital, I think, allows you to uh, to uh, look at more opportunities, perhaps, because there's more capital available. Uh, but, you know, in terms of uh, throwing money around like it's uh, not important, I would say you got to have some good disciplines around your M&A process. And right. so, uh, yeah, do I think the capabilities or the opportunities might expand in this environment? Absolutely. Good. I think and that could restrict also, yeah. of course, when, when rates yeah. rise. Yeah, and to layer on top of that, all the discipline lenders are doing risk analysis. And they're running scenarios at higher interest rate environments. Each institution has a different model. So they're considering that from a lender's perspective. Uh, and they are also looking to have the customers that they're lending into to be thinking about those things as well. Uh, we don't have a lot of concern about higher interest rates today. Um, so it's not a huge concern right now. However, it could be a, a broader concern later if, if they do accelerate. And we've done that with, uh, you know, with our five-year projections uh, that, that we have. We stress test, our, stress test our balance sheet from time to time, putting in different scenarios. Oh, and so whether you're, whether you're modeling a, uh, an acquisition or you're modeling a uh, twenty percent increase in resin prices, or you're modeling interest rate change. Um, you know, you can build those into forecasts and, and stress test your balance sheet to see what that looks like. Excellent. Well, with that, uh, I, I appreciate your your comments today. On all this, has been a great session. We've got through a lot of a lot of different points, a lot of different topics. But uh, we've got to close it now. We could talk more, I'm sure, but. Uh, but uh, but we're getting near the near the end of the period. Uh, I want to thank our four distinguished panelists today: Kate Rich Choi of BMO, Pat McEwen of M Holland, Bob Rule of HPC, and Carl Skoog of BMO. Uh, I'm certainly all coming with strategies to help enhance our business financing, and I want to thank every all our speakers for taking the time to share their critical insights on these topics. We also appreciate your attendance at today's fireside chat, fueled by M Holland and produced by Plastics News. If you want to revisit this chat, the entire event will be archived on our live stream section of plasticsnews.com, our webinar section of plasticsnews.com. Again, this chat and the others in our continuing series can be, will be found on our website if you want to go back to any others also. Thank you for joining us today, and we're grateful for your support in our series of fireside chats throughout the year. Look for the next in our series of fireside chats coming up. We'll talk again soon.